Hello? Ooh, hi. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for coming to this today. Um, welcome to 356 Mission. We are very happy to have Rebecca and her father, Robert Morris, here in conversation. Um, I just wanted to let everyone know that we worked on a book here called Meander Renamed, which is for sale in Ooga Booga, of uh, Bob's Mazes, which are really great. There's also a few CDs um, for sale in Ooga Booga as well. So without further ado, Rebecca. I'm going to introduce my daughter, Rebecca Morris. This is the first time I've had a chance to do such a thing, and I'm very proud. <laughs> Rebecca Morris is born in Honolulu, Hawaii, and lives in Los Angeles. Her work has been included in numerous international shows and group exhibitions spanning the last 20 years. Rose Cut is her 22nd solo exhibition. She has been awarded fellowships from the John Simon Guggenheim Foundation, the Tiffany Foundation, and California Community Foundation. Her work is in the permanent collection of the Museum of Contemporary Art, Los Angeles, the MCA in Chicago, the Bonifantin Museum, and the Goetz Collection. Hall of Art Foundation and numerous private collections. Morris is professor of painting at Pasadena City College. I'm going to introduce my dad. This was boiled down from a 100 page CV. Robert Morris is a well known American composer, scholar, and educator. As of 2015, Morris has composed 160 musical works, including orchestral, chamber, solo, vocal, improvisational, electronic, computer, and outdoor music. Many of these pieces have been performed and recorded by major artists and ensembles, such as the Jack String Quartet, the U.S. Marine Band, Jamie Jordan, Aki Takahashi, and Robert Dick and supported by grants and commissions from the National Endowment for the Arts, the American Music Center, and the Hansen Institute for Contemporary Music, among others. In addition to his music, Morris has also written four books and over 50 articles and reviews which contribute to theories of musical analysis and aesthetics, compositional design, electronic and computer music, and South Indian classical music. Robert Morris is professor of music composition at the Eastman School of Music, where he has taught since 1980. 1980. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we're going to talk first about my dad's piece that was played all day today, but I wanted to say a few words about it before we start. I didn't tell you I was going to do this, but I am. So this is a piece of music that um, I guess I've always loved and always had a great affinity for, and it wasn't until we started talking about this piece of music that I realized that it was sort of written in different versions transpired during my entire childhood. So I think it's kind of bedrocked in there on a certain level. Um, I've had a recording of it for a very long time, and I listen to music when I paint, and I often will listen to my dad's music and um, you know all kinds of different music. But of my dad's pieces, Rady 4 is one that I always love listening to when I paint, and I've always felt that the paintings just looked good when I was hearing his, uh, this particular piece. And then when I was working on this body of work this past year, I listened to Radif a bunch of times and felt that it really resonated with something in the work. Um, so that's a little bit of why this piece was chosen. OK. Um, I knew that this piece is right for this uh, exhibition, having seen some of Rebecca's recent work. And then um, when I saw the Rose Cut advertisement on Facebook, I said, yeah. <laughs> um, it's something very beautiful about these paintings. It's very um, uplifting. They're humorous, but they're also joyous. And they have beautiful contrasts of color and texture. And my piece has some features like that. Uh, Although it's much more ambient in nature than, this, uh, than her work, it still has affinities of 
joyous um, evolution. And um, <clears throat> about this work, it started out when I was teaching at Yale in 1971 or two. Rebecca was just a tiny girl then. And um, I got the idea for writing it because there was, there was some new music that was being t talked about among young composers. It wasn't well known by somebody named Phil Glass and somebody named uh, uh, Terry Riley. And <clears throat> I began to think it would be interesting to write some music in this kind of orientation, mainly because I was very interested in Indian music and I felt much resonance in the music that was going on at that time by Glass, etc. I hadn't known at that point that uh, Phil Glass had studied with Ravi Shankar, for instance. <coughs> but at any rate, I started to work on this piece and I decided I would confine it to just six notes of the scale. And there are four parts to it, radii four, one, two, three, four. The fourth is the most elaborate and is a system of four, uh, 21 pieces, which uh, uh, last, as you know, 50 minutes to play, if you play them one together, uh, all together. They can be played separately, just like these paintings can be shown separately. Um, then the third version was a set of drones, that is, just single tones that interrupt each other in various patterns. The second version was a set of melodies, the very long line melodies that were maybe 20 minutes each and then played in canon by a similar instrument, whatever is playing it. And the first version was 26 canons, uh, little tiny pieces of which are like rounds. And uh, those pieces all have been put, in, put together to make other larger versions of the piece. So Radio 4 and 2 and 3 have been played together, 2 alone, things like that. And the last piece I wrote, wrote I had performed at Yale University before I left uh, there for teaching. Uh, at the University of Pittsburgh for a year or two. Um, at that point, <clears throat> the last concert which I brought Rebecca to was of Ray Deef 1 and 2 played together. Uh, so this piece has a long history, um, and I, I guess I wrote it around the same time in my life the way uh, uh, that Rebecca is in now, in her life, uh, with these paintings. So it's kind of interesting. Um, the nature of the music is about various lines that keep on crossing and intercrossing with each other. There's no basic melody. There are four parts, but there's no basic melody. It's all texture. It's all like streams flowing or clouds going by, things of this nature, which if you pay attention to them, they get really interesting the more you pay attention to it. But you don't have to. You can just get the overall flow. And so it's kind of a piece that's ambient on one level, but if you wish to inspect it and listen to it closely, you begin to see all the patterns that are in it. And these patterns are very complicated, much more complicated than most of the music that it came from, the glass, the Reich, etc. Um, and it was an attempt to take this medium that they established to new heights of artistic sensibility. So. <laughs> OK. <laughs> yeah. What do you want to talk about? Um, we have our list. <clears throat> I don't know. I mean. Uh, oh, I know what okay. I want to talk about. Okay. Um, I want to talk about work ethic. So, um, my dad works a lot, and I grew up with him composing music all the time. And he, well, I'm thinking of Belmont Street in mm -hmm. Rochester and uh, where I lived for t two years in high school. And you had um, a office on the third floor. And we used to joke, remember what was the joke? Um, see you in the next season. <laughs> yeah, he'd be like, see you the next season. And he'd trudge up that last flight of stairs. But um, we did see him. And, uh, but something that I always, uh, I saw you working all the time. And I saw you loving what you do. And I think that I have also a very similar work ethic where I love working in my studio. It's always the thing I want to do, whether or not there's some place for the work to go or anything coming up. I just like being there. I like being by myself. I like having all this time and a place to think. And uh, I don't know, like, I don't know if it's just a personality or if there was something that I saw in your attitude towards your work that also was um, instrumental, but I definitely think we have this in common. Mm. Well, 
Yeah, there's an old phrase, work is not so bad if the day is sunny, but it's very hard to work on a bad day. And that's where the discipline comes in. Um, and you have to work, of course, through all kinds of things in your life, including the fact that you feel that you have left behind people that you care about. And so it's gratifying to me to know that Rebecca understood at some level, even then, that being a composer meant a tremendous amount of time working on the things that were necessary to make my work go as best as it could. Um, but it's very important for people to get very disciplined about their work. There's just no other way around. As they say, you know, 90% perspiration, 1% or, you know, probably 1% inspiration. There are three other things in there that you can't define. <laughs> Um, we've had lots of different conversations about art and making art and um, abstraction and sometimes you know I make abstract paintings your music is abstract and but the way that art you know visual art is abstract is very different than the way that music is abstract and I wonder if you could you know maybe speak to that a little bit well yeah I think uh, we both should speak to because there is this field called abstract art or you know abstract expressionism these terms and of course in music we have terms like this too and they're very very poorly fitted to actually what they describe at least their initial denotation and connotations of those terms are very off from what it is but I will say something about music that people don't usually think about and that is music is inherently transient it is dying away all the time the only reason you have any idea of the musical substance or a, an image of it is through your memory. Otherwise, it's just passing. And the idea of hearing music as just passing is hard to do. And one of the reasons it's hard to do is because in order to make music, we have to abstract it to some degree. So I'll take the simplest idea. Let's say we have a note. Okay. It means nothing by itself. But when it's in a pattern with other things, all of a sudden it has significance. You take the pattern apart, there's nothing there. You put it together, that note is related to all the other notes in the piece and maybe all other notes of that kind in all other pieces. But that level of um, affinity is very abstract because the note itself is, doesn't happen in nature. You, very, you listen to birds um, and notes, uh, uh, things that produce melodies, screams, cries, squeaks, bounces, car noises, any of these things, none of them go They're all much more palpable and down to earth. Those are the discrete um, and immediate concrete sounds. But they're not the ones that we use in music for the most part. We use these and that makes already things. And then the next thing is that's a minor third. You're not hearing those notes at the same time. Even if I can play them together and I can on a piano, you're recognizing something that's between the notes and it's abstract, but yet it has a reality for you. So music, just the simplest attitude is a chord, a note, are already very, very abstract. And then when you get beyond that to musical structure, you know, like form and things like that, it really is out there. But on the other hand, although we say it's abstract in this sense, it's not like it's foreign to us or that it's dispersed or different from us. We take that and understand it can be expressive and beautiful. So this is how music is abstract. And I guess I'll turn it over to you to see what you say about art. <laughs> oh, that's a quagmire. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I don't know. I can't really talk in broad terms about it. It's, I can just talk about how I think about it. And I can barely talk about that. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's hard. I just, I think the thing that I like about abstraction is that it's not verbal and that it's trying to put something out there that's not in um, a strictly linear format and that it's not readable in one way and that it gives maybe the widest audience, the widest level of interpretation, which is also why I don't title things. 
I had I stopped titling I don't know a while ago maybe in late 90s because I realized that that was giving too much not information that was necessarily important but it was leading people into something that they didn't need to go it, it wasn't important it, it it wasn't I didn't want that to color uh, their interpretation of it so for me when I'm thinking about abstraction I'm trying to open things up and make sure they're less narrow so that's sort of what my interest is in it as a language The one thing that I like about Radif as a piece and my paintings is that there are these abstract moments in the, the piece that I think mirror some of the abstract energies in the paintings. There'll be these long cascading sounds that unfold um, almost like a million things, very, I don't even know what the object is, but a million falling things like this and then it creates a, a very large broad feeling and then at the same time maybe quickly after or even inside of that there are these tiny very precise sounds that happen and I think that when I look at uh, the paintings I'm thinking about or I, I see that like in ones like this one or the other one that's similar to it over there or maybe the one with the red border that has these sort of very open broad areas but then these incredibly precise specific moments and those are all things that I I like getting just uh, through a kind of abstraction I don't know it's not very articulate but that's what I've got No, I think you put it well, actually. The, uh, you described some of the things in my piece very nicely. I, I thought that was right. Um, we were talking about how audiences react to you know, our work. Um, and uh, you know, you've had experiences of people coming up to you and saying something about your, your work in some ways, like you just did about mine. And uh, uh, you know, sometimes audiences, I think, think that there's a right answer. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, did I get it? You know, that kind of thing. But um, we were talking about this yesterday. Maybe yeah. we can follow up on it a little bit. Yeah, I've had yeah. I've had people come up and say all kinds of stuff. Like there was this one. I remember I was giving a talk like this once, and there was a woman in the audience who was convinced that there was a boy at a school desk in my painting, and she just kept asking. And I was like, I don't know. Maybe maybe it's there. I I, I didn't see it at first. And then she really insisted, and the whole, we had, you know, we had to see it. And so then we were like, okay, great, I see it. You know, it was really, it was kind of sweet, but it was really important to her that I see it, and then I tell her that I put it there. And um, that's something that's really interesting is when someone sees something in the work and they want you to see it too, and tell them that you did it on purpose so that they're, they have confirmation of it. And, uh, you know you can't really give them that confirmation. So it, it can be tricky, because they want it and you can't really give it. I mean, you can just say, which is what I say, is like, that's great, I'm glad you see that, that's interesting, but it's not the thing. Yeah, I, I think it's not like they're wrong. Yeah, they're because not they wrong. do Because they do actually see this, and it may be something they hadn't thought of before, and it may be very meaningful for them to see it or to realize something in your work. And they come up to you and say, that reminded me of something or other, or uh, they see you're no longer writing tonal music or something like that. It could be a technical description, whatever it is. Um, and what's going on there is simply that, <clears throat> and when you make a work of art, it's not just one thing only. It's not just one interpretation. It's multi-semic or polysemic, multifarious. It coming out from you are all these different meanings, not of all of which you're thought through, but if you have some ability, your work goes out like that to different people. There are all these people out there, and they pick one of those vectors. They, they get it, and they bring it back to you. And maybe one you intended, or isn't it very important to you, or was the main thing, or totally off to the left field, but it's, it's real. 
The problem is, is that they reverse the vector. They, they, the vector is going out to them. They think the vector is coming to me. So therefore, they think that I intended that to happen. Mm, that's See? it, exactly. And I would say that every once in a while, when they reverse that vector, and it's really interesting to me, I'm excited. I mean, has that ever happened to you? Because oh, I've had people say that, and then I'm the really time. thrilled. I'm like, uh, I had a studio visit with a woman, and she, I'd had a lot of people looking at a circular painting, and people kept saying, it's a mandala. And I was like, yeah, maybe. You know, I get it. It's a circle. It's, but then somebody else came in, and they said, no, it's a scarab. And I was like, yeah, it's a scarab. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, that was way more interesting to me. Something that came back to me that was... A, Some a, a closer guess. Yeah, right. You know? Some ma uh, mandalas are scary, though. <laughs> well, not scary, scarab. Yeah. Scarab, okay, yeah, you're right, making yeah. a pun, right? Uh, Sorry. I, I think, <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. Um, I think I'm most interested when a really interesting idea comes back, um, you know, especially something that's provocative to me and makes me think about my work in a different way. That's very yeah. invaluable to me. It's what critics are supposed to do for artists, actually. Uh, and um, I'm grateful for that. And it actually is a measure, as I kind of implied before, of how effective my work is. For how many responses I get back. Not that I got this out to somebody and it came back the way I expected it to. Do you want to talk about that? Um, we just sort of yeah, did. we were kind of talking about an analysis versus synthesis. You know, like when you produce all this nectar is coming out, you're synthesizing this wonderful, hopefully, you know, communication that means, means a lot to a lot of people. Analysis is the other, it's reducing, reducing to one. So in a way, we were talking about synthesis versus analysis. And almost in all the arts, I've heard this phrase, analysis is not synthesis. Reducing to the general or to this particular, either way you reduce, is never the artistic point of view. It's always something you can't define. In fact, if you could define it, it wouldn't be creative, because creative, creativity is by definition incomprehensible. So you know, you're stuck. <laughs> Um, you want to talk about Clifford Still, maybe? Uh, yeah. We both love Clifford Still. He's been to the Clifford Still Museum in Denver twice. I have still not been. <laughs> um, I think you bought all the good books there in the bookstore already, so... It also, he was also displayed at Albright Knox, which is in Buffalo, not too far from where I would live. So yeah, so we would, times. when I'd go, yeah. I don't know if we did this when I was in high school. We must have done it in high school. We would drive from Rochester to Buffalo, which is just like an hour in the car, and we'd go to the Albright Knox Museum for the day. Mm -hmm. And they have, uh, you know, Clifford still, it, at that point, wasn't in a lot of permanent collections. I think SF MoMA. National Gallery in Washington, is that one chunk of work there? And then the Albright Knox were sort of the primary uh, Apparently museum. there's some barn in Maryland that has a lot of paintings that haven't been put up yet. Oh, really? Yeah. Or, or maybe they're now stored in the Clifford Still Museum, but they're not been shown. I mean, he's got a lot of work he didn't show. But from what I remember, he kind of left the New York scene pretty early, disgusted at apparently the politics. And um, for some reason, a lot of his paintings never can get out there. Um, I think that's because of him. Yeah, well, maybe, yeah. Um, but one of the, mm. I'm not, it's hard to describe what we, I don't want to speak for you what you like about them, but one thing I like is I liked the, uh, really, the color and the very craggy shapes and their, I think the dynamism of them and the scale mm -hmm. is, is something that I find very, very striking. And they have a, a primordial quality to them that I think is a real personal goal for me, at least when I'm thinking about how to make an amazing painting. I, I agree with the sort of the dynamism and the, uh, the scale. Uh, to me, I like to hike and go out into nature and it's important, the physical, noumenal quality of nature is very important in my work. I've done pieces that are meant to be played outside, not indoor, they're not concert music, they're like nature is if I can make it a presumption. But at any rate, uh, Clifford Still's work very, seems very natural in this sense of being outside, and yet you're inside. Um, and uh, 
that idea of being inside the painting, I almost feel like I'm in it, inside. I'm one of those shapes looking at another one of me. If, uh, that, that's just incredibly haunting and beautiful. Um, I don't know what to say, but I could stand and look at them for a half an hour without, you know, the time would just go like that. You know, there are a lot of paintings, of course, that do that for me, uh, aside from still. But the, uh, he's particularly wonderful in this regard. Yeah, they're sublime. Mm, yeah. Sublime, that's an interesting word because um, it means, um, in some philosophies, that which, if you were not protected or felt confident in, you'd be scared to death of it. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, going back just to your outdoor, you just mentioned some of your outdoor work, and I remember when, uh, I think after one of your early, out, one of your first outdoor pieces, you experienced a real change in how people responded to your music, which always stuck with me. You know, when you have these, uh, when you've had concerts of your work where everyone is sitting in a concert hall in a chair uh, facing the uh, players, and then they sit there and then the piece goes and then it's over. You know, you'd have a certain type of experience, but then the same sort of audience would be outside and maybe you could best describe the pieces, but they, they're moving, uh, performers who are moving through various aspects of uh, a setting, an outdoor park, and it's fairly unchoreographed and it's, a lot of it's very improvised. Mm -hmm. And then the audience is also free to wander through, uh, I'll just turn it yeah. over to you, yeah. No, that's all right. Uh, they're designed to be played outside, in, and that means their rhythm is very different from inside music. Rhythm is, like, for instance, the structural unit of a piece outside is one minute. That's one, that's like a measure in ordinary music. For me, a minute is a unit of time. And yet, inside that minute, there may be very intricate little things like bees buzzing. If you think about that for a second, you know, like a bee goes like that, you hear all this complicated stuff for just an instant, because it's very, very fast. The frequencies in that are very, very high, and the rhythm is faster than you can actually hear the individual attacks. That happens in nature, too. But our normal rate of speed, you know, let's say breath speed, is faster than the minute, and also slower than these speeds that occur in nature in other ways. So it changes your whole conception of what time is and how it goes. And then time becomes pulled apart like this, so every instant becomes a, a, a moment. Sometimes you use the term static for it, but it's not static at all because inside that gerund or ing, you know, something is just happening, in, the, in that space there is an incredible amount of interest if you pay attention to it. And when people are outside, they tend to pay attention to it. That's why they go there, why they go to the park, why they enjoy walking. And so it's a natural fit. And so pieces, uh, one, I got a review of that very first concert, and a woman from the review said, I would have hated his music inside. It would have been dissonant, discordant. But outside, it was just like listening to bird calls and sounds of animals and wind. And I was very grateful for that, because in a way, my inside music comes from that. But, you know, it can be heard in a very different way. And besides concert halls, what are those? Those are kinds of places where music was played for the last 300 years. There's a joke among composers. We say, what is a composer? A person who died in Germany 100 years ago. <laughs> so, you see, there's this problem we have with the history. I also thought that somehow for people to hear your music outside, it contextualized it in a way that felt more natural and less foreign and less formal, and so that yes. it changed how they could connect to it, and they felt less of a separation and a feeling like they had to know something mm -hmm. ahead of time, or that they needed to be an expert, or they had to have a certain very codified reaction to it, and that somehow outside it gave them a freedom to be and have yeah. a, just a very open, and it took some of the weight off of the reception of it, and then I think once that was gone, they could just sort of 
slip into it in a new way and then I mean that's that's I think that's right yeah. uh, and I would say that the atmosphere in a gallery I don't spend too much time in galleries although I do like art a lot um, and uh, but there's a feeling in a gallery of this kind of openness I know a lot of people come in and they want to show off their rare edition and make remarks to each other or the, their critical prowess or something that I hear that a lot in galleries but I also see people wandering at their own speed and enjoying things when they want to and how they want to. And that's a, a way I think music works. Um, and I think it can happen for all music, not just music that fits this paradigm of outdoorness or in the gallery. It's just that your attitude and your um, expectations have to change. So the last few years I've been writing pieces that are indoors, but are trying to use the idea of a metaphor to the outdoors as producing the right kind of response to it. I mean, basically, when you're looking with, when you're working with the audience, your basic uh, point of view is get their heads pointing in the right direction, and then it's up to them. See, and then that all well, that multifarious uh, communication might happen. Yeah, but I, you know, it's so different though in here where there are objects on the wall. Uh, they, they're not objects, but they're processes. Whatever you, you know, I don't exactly know what the word would be, but. They're paintings, <laughs> and uh, they are focus your attention in different places. They're not global. You actually spend your time looking at these things and, and enjoying them. I, I spent uh, this morning while well, I was listening to my piece and this one here, right here, and you know, there's a tremendous amount of detail and beauty in the inside of it, even those parts, and then also their arrangement. So you know, that's what I would like for my audience in music, but I think it's more natural to happen in a gallery than it is in a concert hall. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about your mazes a little bit because of talking about the outdoor stuff and you oh, mentioned yeah. hiking already. This is, behind us is a maze called Bob's Happy Maze. And this, <laughs> this, this maze is not in the book, but um, it's a little different than some of the mazes that are in the book. Um, so we're going to just go by that. We'll come back to it in a second. But this is one of the mazes in the book. Yeah. You, you chose this one because you had something to say about it. I don't have a thing to say. It's just one of my favorites. Uh -huh. um, but I like the idea that they choose these kind of two bags. They're there. All of the spaghetti is coming out of it and becoming completely messed up. And uh, the idea behind these mazes for me often is multi-dimensional. You know, um, you can draw something on a piece of paper they call a planar graph in mathematics where every point is connected to every other point. But when you, graphs become more complicated, you have to draw, you know, arrows across the other arrows and like under. And what those are representing, every cross of those is representing a different dimension. Because like the piece of paper, two dimensions, this point's far from here, but if I do this, three dimensions, we now have a connection. And so by put, I can put this point under that one this way. So what if we start with two dimensions and have more than two, many dimensions? So what the mazes are really representing in a way is five, seven, 19, 26 dimensions, the kind of thing they talk about in string theory. But what's more interesting to me than that is that it reflects back on two dimension and three dimensional spaces, how many dimensions there are there in our perception we don't actually, well, maybe as artists you're very familiar with this, but. I think a lot of people don't think about when they look at a picture that it is multi-dimensional. And it is in another sense of all the parameters, the color, the shapes, the you know, evocations, the, um, the points, the articulations, those are all different dimensions. And that's more than three, certainly. So it seems to me that one of the things I was interested in the mazes and in my music both was this idea of many, many dimensions. And so that's where this comes from. But this maze was the other one. Let's go back to Happy Maze. Um, Happy Maze was made for Rebecca. She wanted something for her birthday, so she got this. <laughs> <laughs> and it's actually very, it's got a lot of jokes in it. We discussed this in our interview in the book, in the maze book. Um, so I won't tell you all about it. But one of the things that's involved in is my nasal condition, which I used to have a lot of problems with um, <clears throat> sniffling especially on hikes when I get near the golden rod and that sort of Terrible stuff. Terrible allergies. So this maze is a start at the, what would I call that, the patch, the... Um, oh. It's definitely here, it's called. It's called the um, ragweed patch. Ragweed patch. In That's where it starts. Left -hand corner. And it's a real maze and it gets up to something called up the top, the end, Allegra. 
<laughs> which of course is one of the medicines you take for that kind of thing. But also allegra is a pun because it means happy or lively in Italian, and it's a musical term. So that's it. And there are many other puns in there uh, for various things. It's very lighthearted and a fun thing to do. Yeah, for and instance, there's the, um, I don't know how you can point to it, but there are all these little circle pod things sort right, of right. just to yeah. the left of yeah. the center, and then it says the Jolly Rancher hookup, <laughs> because you really love Jolly Ranchers. Yeah, I used to love Jolly Ranchers. Those, those you still things. do. I saw them, the rappers. But now they're sugar free. <laughs> <laughs> Um, also, there's the Wiggle Library in there. Oh yeah, the Wiggle Library. That's good. Uh, those those libraries are uh, actually were something that happened in uh, an old computer program I used. That if you wanted to make a trill sign, you had to put little bits of the trill together. So I made a whole library of different sizes of trills. And one of my friends said, "You know what? You've made a liberal a Wiggle Library." <laughs> so I have to have that in my vocabulary for a long time. And so it's very lighthearted. And in fact, all the mazes are done in a kind of lighthearted way. I spent sometimes uh, one a day for several months. I made some in India, I made some in Paris, I made some in Jurassic, the uh, artist uh, institute that's uh, down north of here, and um, also to Florida. And uh, we have about 35, of, maybe 37 or something like that in the book, but there are many more. Um, and I just enjoyed doing it. But she's the one who told me to work on it, because here's how they started. It was when um, she was a kid, and she would go to bed at night and make a maze for her, so when she got up in the morning, she could do the maze. <laughs> And so that became a thing. And then later on, um, she said, you know, you're really kind of interested in these mazes. You should make more of them. So I took her up on her um, uh, suggestion, and I did this as and a And you would hobby. draw a lot with us as children, too, with um, my sister as well. And I'm not, I was so much older than my brother. I'm not sure. I was already in college. But you drew a lot, and I was already drawing. And you have a very inventive way of of making th things up as you go, and we would make drawings of people together and invent all these different body parts, like the scrapers and things like that. And I do think that that has, um, having that level of invention and freedom in drawing as a child probably just made it a lot easier for me to do other things later as, you know, a, an official artist and not just a kid at a drawing table in the kitchen, but I think I think about all of that as well, and mm -hmm. your mazes uh, with all the levels and dimension, you know, I think about that in the paintings and how to create space, like either really flat space or mm -hmm. deep areas of space, or in the paintings, um, trying to create areas that feel like they're the foreground, but then in another instant, it actually feels more like the background, and so there's mm -hmm. this complete ambiguity of dimension, which That's is something right. that I... I think about all the time. So when I look at your mazes, that's one thing that becomes interesting to me. And as the mazes that you know, you've know you made as an adult aren't really doable mazes. They don't have the beginning and end of when I was a kid, but that's not, not what interests me now. There, it's the crazy formalism and the goofiness mm -hmm. and the yeah. inventiveness and the, the real freedom of line and drawing that is so hard to have, I think. Well, it's being lighthearted, part of it, is not taking things too seriously and just having fun and not worrying about what other people think. You know, that's part of it. And then also, on the other hand, it's also doing it again and again and again and again and again. You yeah, know, we were talking a lot about that yesterday, and just we talk about it from time to time about not caring about what people think. Um, and I don't know who these people are, but they're just people. <laughs> Lowercase, uppercase, yeah, right. people who aren't us or me or in you. In a different or, font. Yeah, they're in a different <laughs> font. But um, we were talking about the effect of this as when you get older or as opposed to how you feel about um, this idea when you're younger as an artist and feeling self-conscious and then how that shifts it. You know, if, if you sort of start at a young age, this, this idea is presupposed on that idea. So if you started at a young age as an artist and continued, like at a certain point, you were saying that you felt, and I'm not 50 yet, but you're past 50, and you talked about a shift at 50, and you were talking about a, just, what did you say? You said like all these inhibitions just 
faded away. And then yeah, right. Uh, well, there's a lot of things that happen after you've been making mm -hmm. music or art after, you know, 30 years, 40 years. Um, you kind of get some self-confidence about it. You realize you can, as they say, work on a bad day. You also realize that if your idea doesn't work out, it isn't the end of the world. You just start something else. You know, you, it's just like becomes, that's I think what the work ethic gets you. It gets you to be able to work creatively with inspiration and yet with all the criticism you need at the moment and just to keep going. And sometimes it's fast, sometimes it's slow. I wrote a piece recently that was a lightweight piece for euphonium and piano, and it took me a month to write it because it was so complicated when it ended up when I was writing it. I didn't expect that to happen. Well, I just lived through those complications, and it came out. Um, then other pieces will write themselves. I mean, it's sort of like that. But another thing that happens, I think, also is that you realize that you've really spent your life doing something, and it is you, in a way, that has made a progress, but that you is burned away too. It's disappearing, it disappears. You, when you get into your work, less and less self-consciousness, just doing the work. You don't even know who's doing it. When you perform, I remember performances like that, I remember being very self-conscious when I played until I was about 19 or 20 years old. And then all of a sudden I played one concert and I realized I had played this whole concert without worrying about a damn thing except making the music as beautiful as I could. And that was a really important watershed shed for me as a musician. And then, I'm not like the next concert I didn't worry because I would, there's a lot of recidivism, but I knew I could achieve that. And that's what I'm talking about. So I think it takes a while for a person to get to the point where they uh, think they can work well. Yeah, so another part of it is as you get older, there are regrets that get expressed in your music or your ideas. Um, things you would have liked to have done, things you got wrong that you can't do over anymore because you're too old to get them finished. Those kinds of things happen. I hear that a lot in late composers that I admire. Uh, Beethoven, for instance, there's this wonderful sense of regret and forgive me and I'm going to go on and despite in the late works that I'm not sure that, maybe they get across to every audience member, but it's, to me it's much more um, uh, part of that music, right? Yeah, yeah. you had said mm -hmm. that um, that that feeling after you finish something, oh, I'll never be able to do that again, or oh, yes. I lost it, or it's shit, it's all gone, or I have nothing left, or how will I make anything good again? You said you stopped feeling that way. Mm -hmm. I'm really looking forward to that. <laughs> Well, I know, but people, I, worry, but I, look, I, but I know people who are older than I am who still, you know, every note is an agony. You know, I, I can't say this is generalization, really, but I think that for me, and I'm, I know other people who have gotten to this point, yeah. I worry about that leaving a little bit because I see it as productive. Mm -hmm. Because when you really think, oh shit, that was the last great painting or the last great thing I did, what am I going to do? It's a really terrible starting place and you sort of have to crawl all the way back through the stages of evolution. But I think for me, I always look back and think that's what made that next great painting anyway. So uh, it, it may be enfolded into the process. Uh, so I am a little afraid if it leaves because I feel like I am operating on that in some way that's uh, working for me personally. So if that leaves, then uh-oh. Yeah. Maybe there's a, an uh-oh I'm not expecting. But it's one, some, something I've been thinking about a lot lately as I look at other artists' work and uh, think about art and painting in general, I feel more and more drawn to looking at artists who are in their older, you know, maybe at the last phase of the work that they're making because I like seeing the whole arc and all the choices they made and all mm, the ways mm. that they made commitments and dug their heels in or what happened after um, really investigating something and putting that much time into something and, and seeing the rewards of what happens. And so that, I'm very interested in seeing that at this point. And I, I think it has to do with my age, which is sort of, I'd like to think that at my age now that I have more in front of me still than I have behind me, mm -hmm. but I'm very conscious of a halfway point in the sense of 20 years behind, hopefully 20 plus years in the future, but this moment of being at this place is very introspective and reflective for me. So it's just this idea of, of time and being an artist and what you do with your time 
is uh, very compelling to me at the moment. Mm. I don't think I meant to say that you don't have struggle in the later parts of your life. I mean, I certainly do too. But it's not the kind of struggle that will get you to the point where you're thrashing around not producing. Yeah. Right. Um, I remember when I was young, when I was 30 years old, I had an orchestral piece. And one day I'd listen to it and say, God, you're a genius. You wrote that great piece. And the next day saying, how could you have done such a bad job? Same piece. Different listening. <laughs> and now, of course, I don't say it's a great piece of genius, nor do I say it's a terrible piece. It's just one of those pieces, which may be pretty good, or maybe it isn't so good, but it's good enough to be in my catalog. <laughs> yeah. um, I don't know, maybe we should take some questions. Yeah. Does that seem good? Is there anything else you wanted to? No. I don't know if there are any questions. Yeah. Oh, this is just like CNN. <laughs> it's just like CNN. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm not gonna wait for this. Uh, how did the piece that was played here? How does that play? I know that you do a lot of theoretical writing. Mm -hmm. I think most of what I'm familiar with is later. Yes. This is a fairly unique piece in my output, um, but it's composed with the same care and. Um, detail as all the other ones. It has, um, of course, because it's based on diatonic things and has connections with minimalistic music, it can get put in a category that it actually isn't. Um, I think there was some statement by the cello player in the Jack Quartet. He was looking at this piece in the library and took it out, and he had this real realization that what music that I'm supposed to be associated with, which is called serialism, is not actually a, anything more than a set of techniques, like brush strokes. I mean, it's part of the work, but it's not defining the work. And therefore, he saw that serialism was not a style any more than tonality is a style or any of these other things are styles. So in a way, this is a, my attempt to explore a certain kind of situation. And I've done this also with other ways, too, like writing a piece without any, you know, totally um, gestures, no notes whatsoever. Or pieces which are very highly structured, like the piece I was talking about a minute ago that was very, very hard to compose because it was intricate and detailed. Every piece has its own characteristics. The quality of the music, um, I like this piece a lot. I mean, I, I think it has a really nice feel to it. Um, and I like listening to it in great detail. You know, like spending my whole 50 minutes spending time in it. It's hard for some people to do, but I, I, I like that. Um, it's not a dramatic piece, it's just about flow. But other pieces that I have are very dramatic, stagey, hysterical, you know, crazy. I mean, every piece is a different animal. <laughs> yeah. Other questions? Oh. Yeah, this one here. <clears throat> Hi. Um, it seems to me that painting and music are both um, really good mediums for uh, improvisation, more so than like anything maybe, like film I, like, is always kind of bad when it's improvised, and sculpture maybe. But um, do either of you um, think of that as important in your work or use improvisation? Yeah, it's really important to me. Um, I'll, I do both. I mean, it, not everything's improvised. That, that would actually be boring to me because I do want some level of um, controlled intent, but I usually think about the improvisation and the controlled intent going back and forth. Uh, so there may be, um, a, a, like in this gold grid painting, uh, the background is, uh, I knew I wanted that kind of a ground, but I didn't know exactly what would happen and then the, the, the grid is more of the controlled intent on top of it, so there's that sort of mix. And then in the paintings that have lots of little different parts, every once in a while I get a really strong idea for what should happen in a section. And then in other areas, I really have no idea what's gonna happen until I start mixing colors, and then I still think I'm not quite sure what's gonna happen when I start going, and I just, it really just happens in the moment. But I, I need that, because otherwise I, I need something to push against, so it's it's a way to have resistance, 
And sometimes the improvisation is the resistance, and sometimes it's the, the more um, defined choice that's the resistance. It's shifting. That was really a great remark. That's right. Improvisation as resistance as opposed to flow and going you know, with your intuition. Like it's, you're trying to do something more than what you've got and trying to do it in real time. But I think improvisation and music occurs at a lot of different levels and with a lot of intent. There's improvisation in jazz, for instance, is based on you know, chord changes and you have to have all your notes fit into the right chord at the right time as you're playing. That's not easy. Or in 16th, 17th century counterpoint, which I practiced myself, uh, writing, uh, composing or uh, playing a fugue or something like that. It takes a lot of practice to begin to get your hands to feel each voice separately and put them together and obey all the rules of counterpoint and yet do something creative. Um, that's one aspect of improvisation. In other words, it's, there's something given, something you have to do that's not easy. And then there's another kind of improvisation which means going completely with your intuition and uh, your inspiration at that moment, seeing where it'll take you. And then there's the thing she mentioned, which was the idea that improvisation can go against the grain to make something have tension, to have something that where you sense a, a, a discordance, which is beautiful against the, uh, some fixity. Um, and then when in the process, because a lot of times uh, people will say, uh, you know, like you're writing counterpoint, let's say again, very rule-bound way of writing the way they wrote 300 years ago. Um, no composer then was struggling with, oh, what's the next thing to do? I know I've got parallel fifths coming here and I blah, blah. No, it just goes like, Chew. it just goes like that. But it happens fairly early in the compositional process and then embellishment happens on top of that. Other times the improvisation happens to the last moment of the process. You've got something you, and you've got to work with it further, take it to a new dimension. Or sometimes it happens in your conceptualization of the work before it ever becomes very palpable. You think, well maybe I could do this, I could do that. Oh, here's an idea and you follow things through. So improvisation can happen at any point but there's also the structural aspect which may result from the improvisation or inspire it or resist it, et cetera. So those are, you know, it's very built into the fabric of music and I'm sure it's gotta be that way for every artist. It's a good question though, yeah. yeah. Could, could maybe both of you talk a bit more about uh, the role of structure, I guess in an opposite manner? Um, I guess specifically, Rebecca, I was curious if there's, um, what your planning is for these, is there like a drawing or anything in terms of structure, yeah. yeah. Um, some of the paintings start with a drawing. It's not normally how I work all the time, but I'd say for these two larger ones, they came out of drawings. Um, and one of the reasons was because the scale is so big, to, to freehand something, I can't see the full mark that I'm making, even if I'm, you know, what I need is I need to be far away to see what I'm doing, but close up to be accurate, and I can't. So I have start, you know, I've been drawing, and then I have used a projection process to get it, and then I always have to shift things around because the scale changes, you know, its appearance, and you know, I'm trying to get a very particular kind of proportion, a very particular kind of energy but that helps get certain large curved shapes and have them translated in the way that I want them. Other pieces, um, you know, like say this one that's the rectangle with the scallop rip. Um, most of it I try to, I knew I just wanted a rectangle with that break and I wanted one type of scallop on one half of the break and another kind of scallop on the other and then after that I didn't know but I knew I wanted that, so then that was my starting point. And then, then there was a lot of time where I just had to think about it to decide what would happen next. But I can't start something completely free form or it's always a disaster because there's not enough there. So there's always some idea, even if it's loose, a color, you know, something. Um, I think there's a kind of drawing that I do in watercolor um, which are not, they're separate than the paintings, they're not ideas that I work on to make a painting from, but after doing these kind of watercolors for many, many, many years now, the effect of quick thinking and working in a very transparent and aqueous way has translated into the oil paint, so that's another way drawing is translated, but not in a, 
a pre-planning way, but maybe more in a stylistic evolution. Thank you for coming. Oh, wait, there's one here. Oh, there's one more. Mahara yeah. has a question. Or maybe there's, I know Mahara does, I don't know. Okay, okay. okay. Then you can go. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was just wondering if dreams and that stuff comes into your work ever. Or Mine? Your, maybe both of you, too. I mean, it, it's like, and the sensibility and the lightheartedness is, is feel that it's kind of been an invitation to kind of, uh, you know, to be a creative person. I will say that I have nightmares about being an artist. <laughs> I mean, it's not really your question, but I, you know, like before, I remember before my first solo, solo show in 1996, it was right before I was gonna hang the paintings and my nightmare was that we hang all the paintings on the wall and all the painting just fell off and hit the floor. And I came into the gallery and I was like, well, I guess it's sculpture. And that was my dream. And I realized that that was a really great dream because I was able to sort of go with it and like turn it around. But I have more of processing, I think, stress or um, conflict more in dreams. I, I don't feel that there's something that happens in my dream state that translates in a way that maybe, you know, surrealists or other people had a, a more direct connection with that. I, I love the idea and I kind of wish it would happen because it sounds really amazing, but it's not happening to me. <laughs> I think there's a whole bunch of states in between wakingness and dream states and it's good to, if you can get a hold of them when you're waking up you're in the shower or mm -hmm. falling asleep because those are the places where you can kind of note and remember an idea that may be very startling. A lot of ideas come to me right after I've woken up. Mm. I've had dreams about writing. Um, in a few cases, I actually had a dream in which I wrote a piece and I remembered it. Um, not a very long piece, but it was there. And I found that I had to revise it significantly before it became any good. <laughs> but I do remember it. So um, I think that dreams are another state of consciousness uh, that are u that's useful to you in all kinds of ways, not only just for creativity, but to understand yourself or to, you know, just get some steam off or, you know, that kind of thing. I, so... Uh, that's a good yeah. answer. I like right, his yeah. answer. Right, yeah. I like the, the idea of not thinking. I took it very literally, but yeah. I like this idea of an in-between state of maybe daydreaming. That's right, yes. Something that I can relate to or that the, I don't know if you do this, yeah. because I don't watch you work, but I will sit and stare, and I know my mind's wandering, but I'm focused at the same time, and that seems to be a very important thing to do, this looking for weeks at something, and imagining and projecting what could be there, so that there's this, a relationship between what could this be, what will I do, what could this be, what will I do, back and forth, and I can, I've had a problem, there was one year where I got too fixated on enjoying that state and not a lot happened, um, but, and it made me a little nervous, but I realized later that that was a very important thing I had to let happen, and I just had to trust that it would be a stage that I needed to move through and that something else would be on the other side and this wasn't some permanent, uh, it didn't feel like I was stuck, it just felt like I didn't feel like doing it, I just wanted to think about it. I don't know. I think all the possibilities you can have, uh, states of consciousness are useful. I think that's why a lot of artists get into substance abuse, um, things of this nature, because it's an expansion of your ability to see, to perceive, to, to uh, jump outside of your own skin, so to speak, um, or to jump inside your skin where you haven't been in there. Uh, and all of those things are very important. Um, and I think any of these things can become abusive, and not only you know just drugs, but you know, egotism is often a very horrible aspect of some artists. Um, they sometimes are able to work despite it, but um, it makes them very difficult people to live with. Um, but that egotism comes from thinking of themselves as bigger than they are, and that's necessary in some respects to make something. You know? 
Yeah. It's coming. This question is for um, Robert and Rebecca. I was hoping you guys can talk a little about how you approach rhythm in art and music. Rhythm? Yeah, rhythm. Maybe you can translate that into repetition. What do you think, can you tell me what you're thinking of as rhythm? Well, in, uh, in your art and in the music, there seems to be a lot of movement in the brush strokes. Okay. Okay. As in, um, I see downward spikes, or, and also in Robert's music, there seems to be a lot of either picking up and then slowing down. Sure, uh, okay, great, now I get it. Yeah. I'm glad I asked. Mm -hmm. Could have really gone off road there. Um, <laughs> um, I think about the rhythm all the time. It's happening inside the paintings. It's happening between them. Um, it's, I, I think of maybe you're using the word rhythm, I'm thinking contrast. You know, I want a sort of healthy contrast, whether it be something busy or still, or rhythm in, or contrast in color or texture um, in something organic, non-organic, saturation. Um, all of these things at once is what's going into making the painting work. And when there's an area that isn't contributing the right kind of contrast or rhythm, the painting isn't functioning. I, I can't really define what it is. It's just a personal taste of what I want to happen. So, um, so that's what happens in the painting. And then when I have a show, something akin to this, you know, it becomes, uh, a, I have to also think about that with how the paintings fit together mm -hmm. on the wall, you know, the idea of, and you know, we spent two days, and it wasn't hard work because often it's very clear what looks good and what doesn't. But what I'm trying to do is to show a range of what I do, but also have them contrast and do themselves a sort of service to each other. I don't like it, say, when paintings that are too similar are next to each other. I, I, it's very rare that I like that because they seem to be duplicating, and I like there to be this um, shift, that there's shifts happening inside and around. So for instance, like these two paintings here, in, this, in a show of this size, I, I, that wasn't interesting to me to have them next to each other. Um, so, but it's, it's hard to put into words. It's usually just like a gut feeling. Um, but I think it translates to other people because usually when I'm installing, I'm doing it with other people or getting feedback and um, it felt very smooth doing this. And you know, when we do something, people are like, yeah, no, that's not quite right. And be like, yeah, I know it isn't. So there's something that, it's not just me, you know, it, it connects. But yes, that's definitely something I'm thinking about. Yeah, um, rhythm means a lot of things in music, of course. Uh, it means like having a beat, it means the pacing of a piece of music, uh, the psychological feel change, um, whether it's smooth or juxtapositions, all those things. There are lots of different say, si kinds of concepts and rhythms that occur together. Um, but basically, I tend not to like uh, regularity in music. Um, I mean, you need it you know, to make sense out of things. But if it's, it's only that, then it seems to bother me. I feel I'm in a box then. And I don't want rhythm to make me feel like I'm in a box. I want rhythm to feel like I'm breaking out of something. Right. Or at least exploding into something else. Or to floating. You're any creating of those. more possibilities, right. not limiting them. And that's, again, fighting against each other, these uh, syncopations, so to speak. But I was thinking about these two paintings that involve circles, and how the rhythm in there is cyclic, because the circle goes and rotates rather than linear, where the uh, paint, like in this one, you, you imagine going off the side and uh, you know, uh, out of the picture plane. But in here, you're in the picture plane. And what's interesting, uh, just geometrically, aside from any uh, artistic intentions, how there are different kinds of circles in there that would rotate at different degrees and different times, like the hour hand versus a second hand on a clock. They move at different rates. 
and form different patterns as they make. And so that's an aspect of rhythm in their painting. And this one, because the grid is against it, it produces the conflict that's in mathematics between what's called Cartesian coordinates and polar coordinates. And there's a complicated way in which you can transcribe one of the uh, a representation of a shape in one of those coordinates to another. And that is very, very interesting in uh, calculus. But what's going on there is a kind of demonstration of that complexity because as that shape rotates in there, it will perform always a different arrangement for the uh, grid around it and therefore produce these complicated patterns. So that's just a very simple answer, but it seems to me that the cyclic rhythm in these paintings and other ones have more linear rhythms. Again, that's just my opinion. It's not, uh, <laughs> it's not any more than that. Pretty good opinion. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so just knowing you over time, this is making a lot of sense to me, and I'm just wondering if you've ever made the connection between growing up with a composer father and like how much of his music were you exposed to growing up? Like, you know, there's a, there can be a distancing between parents and, and kids, but how much of it do you feel like you were exposed to ongoing, and do you ever feel like it heightened a kind of like visual ear in you like I don't know how to like make that more clear but do you ever make a correlation or a connection between what you're doing and and just sort of a kind of intrinsic thing that you've inherited along the way like from from that relationship I think I did hear a lot of what my dad was working on. I mean, I wasn't, I was not always at an age that it made sense or I thought about it in that way, but he had a, um, always had a home office. And, um, and then, you know, when he had pieces played, we always went and we were always a part of it. And then I, I remember when he was at Yale and I was very little, like two or three, and he was setting up the electronic music studio at Yale. I remember going and hanging out in there like for hours yeah, right. at uh, a time and there were like five guys up there setting it all up and I mean I have really clear memories of all of that because it was so exciting and y different and you know even as a kid you knew something was happening. And then if my dad wasn't writing music at home, we were listening to music all the time. So we listened to world music, we were listening to African dance, um, and there was this one record, which was an ethnographic record, so the microphone is moving around the musicians and the dancing, so it's kind of going, uh, uh, like that, so, and that's the Kayumba dance. And we would just dance to it too, um, or my dad would play on piano and he would play all those Rodgers and Hammerstein songs and we would just belt it out. Uh, and then all the South Indian raga music and then, even like we'd get all the pots and pans out oh, yeah. and just have our own orchestra uh, to the music. Yeah. Terry, we would... And this would be like 10th grade in high school I was doing this. So I think the effect of and it... And I was always five years old, <laughs> no matter what. I think the major effect of it was, was just understanding that really diverse things, time periods, cultures, were all equally able to flow and be acceptable and that everything could be part of what you were doing and that that's so I, I didn't I, I think I, Ellen also uh, responded to that and gave uh, an idea mother. yeah that she uh, gave a feel to all musics were equal or at she's least an equal. ethnomusicologist yeah. so that was another layer so she wasn't interested in classical music as being better or more elevated than another kind. She just felt there were different kinds of musics for different purposes and uh, ideas. I certainly believe that myself too. Um, but one thing I never did is I never took, went home and said, okay, here's my new piece, everybody. Come into the dining room, we're gonna listen to it. What do you think? You know? uh, once in a while I do that with my wife, but not with the kids. Um, you know, it just. Although there was one time I went into your room and played a bit of a piece I was working on for computer tape and flute, and I went up to a point. Uh, I was at a particular point in the piece, and somehow I ended up playing it for you. But it's the only time I ever had the intent to play something I was working on for a member of the family. I mean, in yeah. a way, it was it was pretty amazing. So it meant that I 
grew up without feeling that there was something I had to break down in my education. Like I had to be, I didn't ever go through a phase where I had to be like, oh, that could be cool too, or oh, I'm allowed to do that. I never had that. In fact, I had the reverse problem. I remember listening to Killing Jokes, some mm -hmm. Killing Jokes song really loud in my room and you just barged in and I thought you were gonna yell at me and you went straight to the stereo and you just turned it up louder and you were like, this kind of music needs to be heard at a higher decibel. And then you stormed out of my room. And it's like, when you're 14 years old and your dad comes in and tells you you're not listening to Killing Joke the right way, you feel like, fuck, I'm fucking up 14. You know, you're just like, so that was, I had but reverse I she problems. Was, she was listening to it like very tentatively and it was really powerful and it needed to be loud, you know? <laughs> so, I had different issues. <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> on, on behalf of 356 Mission and Ooga Booga, I want to thank everybody thank for coming. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah. And thanks to Bob and to Rebecca. Uh, Bob will be available to sign copies of the Mays book yeah, now we'll if you guys copies. are interested. Right, fine. Yes. Cool. Right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody.